Brought to you by PrayLatin.com, makers of prayer cards featuring complete English phonetic renderings of Latin pronunciations. About a month or so ago, I reported on a letter that had quietly been making the rounds in the Roman Curia that had been penned by an anonymous cardinal, a cardinal that later many suspect was Cardinal Pell from Australia. It was addressed to his brother cardinals, and it warned that the church was heading towards catastrophe due to the choices made by Francis and his clear breaks from the faith, and that at the next conclave, the bishops have the utmost responsibility of choosing a successor to Francis who will correct his errors and reestablish the church as the voice for Christ standing up against the errors of the modern world. The letter was signed by an anonymous named Demos, and again, people think it was Cardinal Pell. But this should give all of the Catholics who rail against being anonymous in this kind of discourse pause, since a high-ranking prelate decided to actually go that route himself. Today, I have for you part of an interview published by The Remnant recently that was conducted by Dion Montagna with Monsignor Bucks, an influential observer of all things in the Roman Curia, who is generally considered to be on the traditional side of things on most issues, although he is more clearly aligned with the sort of the hermeneutic of continuity side of the grand debate in the church in our time. His commentary on what the next conclave must accomplish, I think is definitely worth your time amid all these rumors that Francis's time is running near to its end. So let's get into this. For those who might not know who he is, Monsignor Bucks is what gets often called a Vaticanista. It's a term that describes a Vatican insider with a great depth of knowledge about the inner workings of the upper echelons of the Catholic Church and the woes that have befallen it. He is definitely on the Benedict XVI hermeneutic of continuity side of things in the great debate in the mainstream church. His central thesis over the time of Francis's reign appears to be that the church is in a state of moral and doctrinal anarchy with severe consequences for the secular world. The church should stand as a witness against these errors, according to his view, and his view is not one that is taken all that seriously by the forces presently running the church because they are almost 100% aligned with Francis. In the interview published by The Remnant, Monsignor Bucks is asked a few questions about the next conclave, but I'll focus only on one of the questions and his answer, which is lengthy. If you want to read the full interview, check it out for yourself on the Remnants website. They do great work over there. Or you can find a link to it in my show notes today at returntotradition.org. That's the name of this podcast with a .org at the end. Simply skip past the Patreon pop-up unless you're looking to become a patron of the channel. And look for the post with the same title as this video. And you'll find the sources for this interview. And the other one that I reference for some context over there on that post. Anyway, the interview was conducted by Diane Montagna who is by no measure a radical traditionalist or someone considered a firebrand polemicist. She asks Monsignor Bucks a series of honest and on-target questions about the purpose of the next conclave. Here is the most important question she asks, followed by Monsignor Bucks's response. Quote, what do you think should be the priorities for the next conclave? Monsignor Bucks's response, In the opinion of authoritative laymen and ecclesiastics, the next conclave should choose a pope who is aware of his apostolic mandate, his obligations, and his duty to preserve the status generalis ecclesia, to choose a pope who will promote the Catholic faith, put a stop to the reduction of priests and faithful in the West caused by the secularization that has penetrated the church. Pegway held that clerics are to blame for this dechristianization according to which the main values on which society are founded are not religious, and if they are, must be justified in a secular or rational way. The result is politically correct language purge of religious connotations, the loss of the sense of limits, the loss of the sacred, and the transformation of religious faith into a humanitarian religion, the gospel into a moralism, and the homily into a rally. The priority of the conclave is therefore to choose a Catholic pope, Otherwise, the loss of faith will not only be the effect, but also the cause of the secularization of Christianity, which will end up becoming irrelevant. The next conclave will have to clarify what it means to be pastoral. No one knows so far, and it is used as a passe partout to justify everything in the church. It must put her now devalued mission back at the center and clarify the limits of ecumenism and interreligious dialogue. Even modernists and progressives are aware of this. 
Secularization must be fought with evangelization. The fight against clericalism must not subvert the identity of the clergy, which is an order distinct from faithful and religious. The next pope must have the fostering and increase of faith at the top of his agenda, so that Christian families and priestly and religious vocations may flourish. It is necessary to return to the magisterium that decides infallibly on matters of family morals by appointing bishops who accept the apostolic tradition. The schism, now latent, will likely be attenuated, even if the, quote, persecution by the secularist media will increase. We need to liberate the living forces of the church with a pontificate that looks to a Catholicism that fills churches with devout believers in the public square with witnesses of faith and life, proving that it works because it produces conversions. The Catholic Church must have a pope who says and does what Catholic, what is Catholic, morally, doctrinally, and liturgically. Recall the cover of Time magazine. Is the Pope Catholic? Is it strange that the Catholic Church is entitled to a Catholic Pope? The Orthodox also want such a Pope. Otherwise, the centrifugal tendencies among them will take over. A Catholic Pope is necessary to bring the shattered Protestant world back to unity and the many lay people who are searching back to faith, but also to assure those members of other religions who see in the Pope the moral authority who points out that the boundary between good and evil has not been abolished. The new pope will have to be able to face the Leviathan that is emerging from the death of the old, with a lesser role for the West and the Western capitalist system. He will have to be different from Francis, who had a confusing and contradictory relationship with it between ideology and utopia. In order to put an end to the confusion in the church, the next conclave will have to look for candidates who respond to the dubia on Amoris Laetitia, Correct Evangelii Gaudium, where it says that the worst social evil is inequality, i.e. a bad distribution of wealth, and not sin. Laudato Si, where it exalts an anti-human green program, which instead is the origin of all the problems of the last 50 years. Fratelli Tutti, which declares capitalism to be over, then suggests how to survive and camouflage oneself with magic words, inclusion, and sustainability. Above all, the encyclical fails to say that if we don't acknowledge our Father who is in heaven, we cannot see ourselves as brothers. Jesus said it, end quote. In other words, Monsignor Bucks says that the next Pope's task is to undo the Francis pontificate in virtually all matters. He just described virtually the entire program of Francis as things that the next Pope has to address. The conclave that is coming in the next few years must choose a Pope up to that task. Is that even possible? That's my question. Francis has elevated something like 60% of the bishops into the office of cardinalate, and they will be the ones who participate in the next conclave, making it appear unlikely that the man who emerges as the next pope will be able or willing to do anything to stem the tide of the auto-demolition of the faith. We live in a time of doctrinal and dogmatic chaos, where what Catholicism actually means is really up in the air, at least for the typical Catholic who isn't paying attention to such things. Monsignor Bucks has been hitting this point for several years. I've presented his letters a few times in the past, mostly from Italian journalist Marco Tosati's website, since Monsignor Bucks is more well-known in Italian and European circles than he is here where I am in America. In 2017, Monsignor Bucks was asked by Edward Penton in an interview about the problems in the church in our time. Five years ago, Monsignor Bucks issued a warning that was obviously not heeded, that we are in a time of doctrinal and dogmatic chaos, and that the church must take action to correct the errors growing in our time. From that interview, quote, the first implication of doctrinal anarchy for the church is division caused by apostasy, which is the abandonment of Catholic thought as divine, defined by St. Vincent of Larens, quod semper, quod ubique, quod ab omnibus creditor, what has been believed everywhere, always, and by all. St. Irenaeus of Lyon, who calls Jesus Christ the master of unity, had pointed out to heretics that everyone professes the same things, but not everyone means the same thing. This is the role of the magisterium founded on the truth of Christ, to bring everyone back to Catholic unity. St. Paul exhorted Christians to be in agreement and to speak with unanimity. What would he say today? When cardinals are silent or accuse their confreres, when bishops who had thought, spoken, and written, scripta ma ment, written words remain, in a Catholic way, but then say the opposite for whatever reason. When priests contest the liturgical tradition of the church, an apostasy is established, the detachment from Catholic thought. Paul VI had foreseen that this non-Catholic thought within Catholic Catholicism will tomorrow become the strongest force, but it will never represent the church's thinking. A small flock must remain, no matter how small it is. 
end quote. Put in the light of the German synodal way, the larger synod of synodality, and just more broadly the errors of Francis in our time, and the errors that had frankly been widespread and promoted by his predecessors since the 1960s, you can see how we have gotten to a place where the Catholic faith, as taught by men who hold official teaching and pastoral offices, has become frankly incoherent for much of the faithful. Doctrinal chaos reigns. If Monsignor Bucks's recent comments to Diane Montagna are correct, and I think they are, the next, post, the next pope must be chosen specifically to correct modern errors. That is a monumental task for any member of the hierarchy at present, since most, if not all of them, were formed in this age of doctrinal chaos, and many of them, frankly, agree entirely with the program of Francis. In his interview with Mr. Penton, Monsignor Bucks correctly illustrated the implications of these errors. Quote, the apostle exhorts us to be faithful to sure, sound, and pure doctrine that founded on Jesus Christ and not on worldly opinions. See the letter to Titus, chapter 1, verses 7 to 11, and chapter 2, verses 1 to 8. Perseverance in teaching and obedience to doctrine leads souls to eternal salvation. The church cannot change the faith and at the same time ask believers to be remain faithful to it. She is instead intimately obliged to be oriented toward the word of God and toward tradition. Therefore, the church remembers the Lord's judgment. For judgment I came into this world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. See John chapter 9, verse 39. Do not forget that when one is applauded by the world, it means one belongs to it. In fact, the world loves its own and hates what does not belong to it. See John chapter 15, verse 19. May the Catholic Church always remember that she is made up of only those who have converted to Christ under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. All human beings are ordained to her. See Lumen Gentium, paragraph 13 but they are not part of her until they are converted." End quote. It would be nice to have a Pope who spoke like that, taught those things, believed them, and made it obvious that he actually believed what he was saying. That is at the core of the task for the next Pope, whenever he should appear. The reports that Francis's time is running short may be exaggerated, since we've we'll been getting those reports by Vatican-connected reporters for the past two or three years with no real sign of them coming true. But also, on the other hand, Francis is no longer a young man, 84 years old, so his time may be short. Pray for his interior conversion before his time does come to an end. It is a great act of charity for you to do so, and God will reward you for overcoming your interior barriers to praying for someone who needs it, especially if you really, really, really don't care for them at all. So is Monsignor Bucks correct in his assessment of things, or does he not go far enough in correcting the errors of the modernists? Is he wrong at all and should just embrace Francis's program of renewal of the springtime of the Church of the New Advent? And instead, should he be working for the ascension of a Francis II, probably in the mold of a Cardinal Zuppi or a Cardinal Togle? Let me know what you think about this in the comments, please. And like and subscribe if you haven't. It really does help. And as always, and always pray for the Church. I'm Anthony Stein. Ave Maria.